Well, we, we're certainly um, in, in Scotland taking the, the first statutory uh, targets for annual uh, climate change targets for greenhouse gas emissions. And we have a, a target of 42% reduction by 2020. Uh, we're more than halfway towards achieving that with a 24.3% reduction after including the ETS impact, but net of that 22.8%. So. Uh, we're more than halfway towards achieving the target. We have a target for 80% reduction by 2050. Mm -hmm. And uh, to say we're the first uh, government in the world, administration in the world, to have legally binding targets for uh, climate change. And how are you, um, give us a sense of how you're attempting or trying to achieve that. Is, it, is this via energy efficiency measures, and clearly Scotland, which is, um, I know it was snow snowing in London today, but Scotland is slightly colder, so I imagine energy efficiency is a key um, a key concern of yours, but is it energy efficiency and, and renewables? And give us a sense that the balance between those two. Yeah, we, we have a target in Scotland for to, to be able to generate 100% of our electricity demand uh, by 2020 from renewable energy. Uh, we currently, in 2011, we were able to generate 35% of our mm -hmm. electricity through renewables. Uh, we have had a substantial increase, about 12% in the scale of renewable activity in Scotland, up to 5.4 gigawatts um, of installed capacity. Um, since last year, so it's gone from 4.8 to 5.4, and it's, it's, it's very much uh, a counter-cyclical investment pipeline that we're seeing in Scotland, so it's helped our economy, but also is a good thing for the environment. But you're quite right, we are uh, a country which has uh, below average temperatures in a global sense, so uh, domestic energy efficiency is very important to us. It's one area that we're conscious that as a country with a lot of old housing stock, we need to do a lot to <coughs> convert that old housing stock um, to more energy efficient uh, standards and so we've got a national retrofit program mm -hmm. to improve energy efficiency through insulation, uh, boiler scrappage, so we're replacing old gas boilers with new ones and that's worth uh, 250 million over the three year period but we're also hoping to use the green deal money that the UK um, will generate from uh, energy companies to supplement that so we'll be hopefully spending up to 200 million a year um, renewing our, our housing stock in terms of energy efficiency measures. So those are two very important planks. Um, we uh, had a, a recent parliamentary report which did, which, uh, from our Energy uh, Enterprise and Tourism Committee which said our 100% target was achievable. Um, we have some skills uh, issues to overcome but we're confident we can achieve that target and have set an interim target for 50% by 2015. And what are these policies, what are they adding to um, fee payers bills because that is the big question in the whole of the UK. How much are these green policies? How much these are these efforts to um, promote renewables? What, what are they going to cost consumers? Well, we're facing a situation at the moment in Scotland where people's energy bills are rising dramatically and fuel poverty is going up. But that's because of the uh, the, the, the scale of price rises in the gas wholesale market. Mm. So yes, there has, has been a small increase in uh, in electricity bills as a result of subsidies through feed-in tariffs and rocks renewable obligation certificates in Scotland. But it's probably on the order of about 6% increase in bills, but maybe a 30% increase is due to the impact of the wholesale gas market. So in investing in renewables and investing in energy efficiency, we hope to uh, future-proof Scotland's uh, population against rapidly rising gas prices mm -hmm. um, on the world energy markets. And it's always struck me as slightly curious that Scotland's gone for the renewable energy and low carbon future because you've got such a it's an amazing history for the last 30, 40 years in exploiting the um, oil and gas reserves <coughs> around the Scottish coast. So give us an idea of the motivation. Why on earth, if you have all those reserves, a bit like Qatar here, why on earth would you want to um, go and invest in something which is you know, taking your economy away from, from that, um, that source of energy? Well, in the case of Scotland, we have about four decades worth at least of oil and gas activity to go. But there is a recognition that we need to um, diversify our economy away from dependency on oil and gas and to protect our customers from uh, being exposed to rapid rises in prices in the, the gas market. So renewable electricity in this sense, while it has an upfront cost, uh, wind itself is a, is a free resource. So the, the, the cost comes in the capital investment. Thereafter, you don't have a rising price of wind itself. So it's, it's future-proofing our economy, it gives us the ability to potentially generate up to seven times our electricity requirement if we were to exploit all the renewable electricity options we have available to us. We've got 25% of Europe's uh, tidal power and, and, and uh, offshore wind power and 10% of the wave power uh, resource in, in the continent of Europe. So it's a huge opportunity and I think it would be remiss of us to, to ignore that. Oil and gas has a, a bright future for another four decades but we can't guarantee it will last forever and as a scarce resource it has to be stewarded carefully 
um, and, and used efficiently so that we're not uh, you know, exploiting a natural resource in a wasteful way. So I think the combination of investment in renewables will rely on gas for some time to come in terms of baseload and we're hoping to take on uh, carbon capture and storage investment uh, in two sites in Scotland to enable us to uh, use that gas in a way that reduces emissions and helps to provide the baseload in as efficient a way as possible. The, um, the UK Climate and Energy Minister Greg Barker was talking today about um, a uh, planned um, private sector sort of low carbon investment summit I think in Abu Dhabi next year. Are you finding that from a Scottish perspective that um, you can sell yourselves to people um, as being sort of, even though the flag's blue, green Scotland, um, sort of at the home of the low carbon economy. Is that, is that becoming, are you seeing real gains out of that? Uh, absolutely. We estimate that by um, 2020 uh, we will have up to 10% uh, of our GDP will be in the low carbon economy mm. and 5% of our workforce by 2015-16 will be in the low carbon economy. So we're already gaining substantially from investment in renewables and the, the fact that we've had a 12% increase in our renewable capacity just in the last year alone uh, tells you the sort of scale of investment but with another £9 billion pounds worth of projects in the pipeline already that are, that are known about um, there's a huge opportunity for us to, to grow employment in Scotland and to develop expertise that we can then use to export to the rest of the world but we are keen uh, to share our expertise with developing nations and um, that's something that was, uh, I would be keen to get across to mm. Uh, this particular conference. Uh, we, we're doing work in Malawi, which is a country that we have a very strong partnership with, but we're taking forward our climate justice uh, approach to try and work with other developing nations in sub-Saharan Africa mm -hmm. to try and help them exploit the technological uh, opportunities that arise. In many of those countries, uh, the share of population have access to electricity at all is very low, so by enabling them to generate their own electricity, that allows their co economic development locally uh, to uh, progress as well. What's, um, climate justice is clearly a really important issue and people have been talking a lot about it um, in the last two weeks, but what's, what's in it? If you're, a, if you're a minister, you've always got to reflect back and talk back to your constituents. What's in it, what's in it for them? Why, why should Scotland be you know, off, off helping countries in Africa when you, know, you, like everyone else, have problems of your own to deal with? Well, I think there's, there's two main reasons for doing it. One, um, it's the moral thing to do. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's uh, beholden on developed nations to recognise that we have a responsibility to, to the rest of the world. We have benefited from industrialisation and through a very carbon intensive phase of industrialisation in the past, which has contributed to the problems we face today. So uh, what we're trying to do is help those developing nations skip that carbon intensive phase of their economic growth, mm -hmm. allow them to grow their economy by ex exporting technology in terms of renewable electricity generation and enable them to, um, to, to, to grow sustainably. Now, for any developed nation that exports goods and services to the rest of the world, it's in our interest to have other parts of the world growing as well in terms of their, their prosperity. They can buy goods from us, they can buy services from us. So the immediate issue is to try and help our, our friends across the world to address the impact of climate change itself. But in the longer term, with stability and prosperity in these countries, hopefully they will become uh, nations that will buy goods from Scotland and, and it's about being a good neighbour. Uh, so I think it's, uh, it's initially a moral message, but also it's, it's in everybody's interest um, as consumers, as, as workers in, in Scotland producing goods that could have a value to other countries to ensure those countries are robust as possible and able to afford the kind of products we're able to produce. Mm -hmm. And on a final point, um, how as a Scottish um, minister at these talks, how, how can you feed into the negotiations? What kind of role is there um, for you and your colleagues um, within, within these talks and within the kind of UK and the EU delegations? Well, we're, we're a formal part of the um, UK delegation, so we're making ourselves available to the UK to assist them with bilateral meetings, meeting NGOs, mm -hmm. um, had discussions with a number, including the Third World Network, uh, Pan-African uh, Climate Justice Alliance mm -hmm. and, and others to, to, to identify what their concerns are, relay them back to the UK delegation, um, take, we've taken part in the EU coordination meeting as an observer this morning, that was very interesting for us. Uh, and sat through the plenary session for the ministerial round table uh, to hear the statements from other countries. So it's relaying those messages back to uh, UK colleagues where act as um, uh, extra sets of eyes and ears for them to, mm -hmm. and, and to help get across the message of what the UK is doing, what Scotland is doing within the UK and what uh, the EU is trying to do as well in terms of negotiations and hopefully be able to answer questions from those who, who, who are curious as to what we're trying to, to achieve in Scotland as well. It's a good opportunity to put a positive image across of a developed nation and what we're trying to do to assist developing nations to address the challenges they face. And I guess, uh, you know, final point, we started with ambition, let's finish with that. 
um, what role can Scotland play, um, at least for the next couple of years, in within the UK pushing ambition, pushing climate ambition? We know the UK as a whole wants to go to take a 30% emission reductions target. You're going, you're going sort of um, further. What what role can you play within the UK to really, you know, be a be a force for change from that point of view? Well, I think we, we can obviously by setting the bar higher that um, that that creates a. Uh, a bar which against the UK themselves as a government will, will judge their actions but I think it's just providing positive examples attracting in, inward investment to, uh, to, to to Scotland helps the UK with its, its progress to meet its own targets so um, I think it's about saying positive example emphasizing the value to uh, consumers and, and uh, businesses across uh, Scotland helps inform a message across the whole of the UK about the need for meeting these targets and how individual businesses which may straddle the border um, can can contribute to, to addressing climate change. So there's many ways in which we, we contribute. We're, we're hoping to have a, a, a climate justice conference next autumn in, in Scotland, yeah. which we've agreed with Mary Robinson and, uh, and, and the World Resources Insti uh, Institute. Uh, and that hopefully will raise the profile of climate justice too and help build on the work that both the uh, Scottish Government and UK Government are doing to address adaptation, um, which was obviously announcement yesterday, which I, I see as a very positive one. And we hope to continue to keep the pressure up for, for more action from within the UK and hopefully in two years' time we'll have a direct voice in these kind of conferences.